بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه السلام عليكم ورحمة الله Thank you so much for joining me for this special lecture on explaining the Quran through the Quran and it's special to me because as far as I can recall I've never actually delivered a lecture on this core topic of my PhD research uh, because it was specifically about this method of tafsir of exegesis called Tafsir al-Qur'ani bil-Qur'an. So although I've talked about it at great length and my thesis has been on the internet for a couple of years now, um, I've never got around to actually delivering one joined up presentation about this topic. So inshallah, I'm doing that now as part of um, an effort to uh, look again at uh, one of the core chapters of that thesis and rework it for the sake of producing this book which will be by this title, inshallah, explaining the Quran through the Quran. Um, the, the cover may or may not look like this, uh, but details are still being worked out about the publisher um, of this book in due course, uh, by Allah's permission. So I'm going to try to find a way of fitting, um, you know, the work of, of quite a few years into the space of an hour, an hour and a half. And uh, at the end of that, I quite happily take your questions uh, for those who are tuning in live. So the purpose is also to lead us towards discussing the tafsir of Surah Al-An'am, the sixth chapter of the Quran. And that is one of the chapters from the thesis, but the thesis contains more of a thematic uh, approach to that study. And the book will contain a verse by verse commentary, uh, which you know builds on the work that I'd previously done. So let us proceed. So the first question is, of course, what is tafsir al-Qur'an bil-Qur'an, in case that's not something obvious to everyone watching. It is explaining the Qur'an through the Qur'an, which is to say, referring to other parts of the same scripture to clarify a particular verse or enhance our understanding of it. That's one way we can define it in fairly simple terms. Okay, so we're looking at a particular verse. We want to understand what it means. When we refer to other sources, such as a hadith that might help or we just make recourse to sources of the language um, then we are not doing tafsir al-Qur'an bil-Qur'an the bil-Qur'an bit is where I look at the Qur'an itself uh, and that doesn't mean just staring at the ayah itself okay it means finding something else in the Qur'an it may be uh, the verses just before or just after it may be elsewhere in the same surah it might be anywhere in the entire scripture. So I want to um, draw your attention to this image which alhamdulillah I, I designed. Um, it's, a, it's a draft, it's an idea to try to express um, the, the content of the book and the basic premise of this is to see the Quran as a world. Now I hope that you can catch the idea here that this is supposed to be um, similar to those flight maps that you see. Right? An airline might say, we go from this airport to that airport. These are our routes. Okay. And as you can see, uh, we are assuming here that the earth is round, uh, which is why there are um, flights going off to the east and coming back in to the west. Okay. Just in case anyone's concerned about that. So what I've illustrated here first is the idea of the Quran as a world. I don't want to elaborate too much on that, but I definitely want to get away from illustrating this by saying the Quran is a book, as a closed book with covers, and then you have this linear progression from the beginning to the end of it. But rather the Quran in terms of what it contains, um, the, the themes and the guidance it contains, you know, has been compared to the world or to the whole universe. So here I'm just conceptualizing it as if it was, it's the landmass of the earth, right, as a way of drawing that. And then we've got an image which is from the famous blue Quran, if you're familiar with it. And you can almost imagine that um, the countries individually are like surahs of the Quran, and then the continents are like groups of surahs, something along these lines, right? Um, so within that, even before drawing these lines on top of it, you would have had a sense that there are uh, connections and disconnections within, you know, continuities and discontinuities within the Quranic text. Um, where, where things are bound within surahs 
and then they're separated off by these these surah divisions but then they are brought together again in the way that we recite the quran from cover to cover then these lines are supposed to indicate that we can in a sense fly between one surah and the other between one ayah and another ayah and we do that by choice so it's quite deliberate that i'm indicating this by these flight maps to say it is not that the ayahs are inherently connected arguably they there's a connection between them but the mufassir the exegete is someone who makes those connections who um, who finds what is similar between the ayahs or finds how another ayah is relevant to the ayah that i'm looking at at the current moment so from there we get the idea of the levels of eqq Okay, so EQQ is going to be our shorthand for explaining the Quran through the Quran, right? And if we're saying it in Arabic, it is TQQ, Tafsir of the Quran through the Quran. So if you've read my thesis or parts of it, then you'll be familiar with that uh, shorthand. But now we are graduating to EQQ in full English, as you can see. Levels of EQQ, there could be a word in the ayah that I want to understand. So. I can look through the Quran and find other usages of that word or of the same root in order to explain. Um, I can find on the level of the verse that I'm looking at, another verse or other verses throughout the, the whole Quran, which are very similar to it, or even exactly the same as the, the phrase or the ayah that I'm looking at. So this is what we're terming parallels. Near parallels is where it's very similar, but there's something different about it. And what I should point out here is that the similarity can be important. The difference can also be important. It can also be a cause uh, for me to make observations and therefore to be able to do tafsir, you observe the similarities and the differences at the same time. Also on the level of verses, there may be things about uh, the ayah I'm looking at that other verses would modify my understanding. I'm looking at something and the, the plain sense of it tells me one meaning, but I know that I have to adjust that uh, understanding when I look at the other verses. I see, ah, actually, no, I have to understand this a bit more carefully. That's what I'm just calling very broadly a modifier or evidence. If there's something about this ayah I want to claim, I think that it means this. And the way I'm going to show that is by going to this other verse, which may not be a parallel or near parallel, but there's just something about it which uh, is relevant enough for me to say, ah, that other ayah functions as evidence for what I'm saying about this ayah. Okay, so that's another level of EQQ. And then there is passage context. So within the surah or within the few verses that precede or follow the ayah under study, this is contextual reading, which is another form of tafsir al-Qur'an, bil Qur'an, because I'm using the Qur'an to explain the Qur'an. And that context is always important, whether you're calling what you do EQQ or not. Um, but even if I'm looking at, for example, the other verse, which is supposed to be evidence, I need to look at the context of that other verse as well. Studying the context of each verse that I'm, I'm looking at or using, is essential to make sure you understand them individually and therefore you're able to use them uh, for these different kind of intratextual operations. Intratextual, I mean, within the Quran. So there are many good reasons to do tafsir al-Quran bil-Quran. So some of these I'm taking from scholars who have said these before, but to a large extent I've adjusted this based on my own study and, and critique of some of the things that have been said in this department. So good reasons to do tafsir al-Qur'an bil-Qur'an. First of all, the Qur'an is one book. If it is from one author, if we can use that word, we hopefully understand exactly what we're saying here. And it is fully consistent within itself. If you assume all these things, then it makes perfect sense that uh, you would look to various parts of the scripture to make sense of anything that you are trying to figure out, okay? All Muslims would agree that the Quran is the greatest authority on all matters of religion. It is the most authentic source for anything uh, because 
We don't have, for example, Sahih ayahs versus Da'if ayahs or difference of opinion over which is Sahih and Da'if. The Quran is accepted in a way that other sources, which are also important, like Hadith, uh, cannot really compete with. Right? It's 100 percent Qat'iyu thubut. Right? In the technical term, it is definitive in uh, its transmission. So, if it's the greatest authority for all knowledge in Islam, then that should apply also to tafsir. That is to say, it is the greatest authority for tafsir of the Quran. Now, thirdly, this is um, a very general point that can apply to other types of uh, text as well. It makes sense to consider immediate context and wider textual context, right? A holistic reading of the Quran. Hopefully that's a point that is quite intuitive and doesn't need much elaboration. Fourthly, and you know, we wouldn't have the time to dive into this uh, too much, but the Quran itself seems to invite this approach. In short, I'm saying that uh, the fact that there are things which in one surah are very brief and then in another surah are expanded is just one factor which shows that it's as if we are supposed to look at the Quran in this way. And then there are also some ayat which seem to say things that lead us to that, such as uh, verse 7 of Ali Imran, which talks about um, that there are muhkamat and mutashabihat. There are some verses which are foundational uh, and so clear in their meaning unambiguous and there are other, others with, which are mutashabihat and then scholars have understood that this means you are supposed to um, use the muhkamat to understand the mutashabihat when you find something that is ambiguous unclear open to interpretation or even open to dispute the best thing you can do is find the muhkamat of the book the foundational clear incontrovertible verses and interpret those trickier ones in the light of them okay so that's something and that's an example of where the quran invites this approach and finally here that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the early muslims acted upon it so we have some hadiths in which the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has explained the quran using other verses and we have a few of those which are authentic hadiths um, and as it happens the you know the two most authentic ones pertain to Surah Al-An'am. That's one of the reasons that I've chosen that Surah to focus upon. And we find amongst the Sahaba and Tabi'een plenty of examples where they have explained one ayah with reference to another ayah. Now let me take some misconceptions. And when I say misconceptions, I don't just mean among the common people, but I mean even things that you can commonly read in books by very respectable authors, uh, but which are problematic. And we're going to see some uh, direct quotes which we'll, we'll discuss. First of all, this would not be said by respectable um, scholars really, that tafsir of the Quran through the Quran is the only acceptable way because the Quran is the sole legitimate source. Uh, mainstream Islam recognizes other sources, above all the Sunnah, okay? So, um, interestingly, I, you know, I'm, I'm not talking about it in the presentation today, but I have looked at sources, uh, in writings of people who are called Quran only, uh, or who are Quranists, sometimes are called. And you might think that because they don't recognize other sources, that they do EQQ very well and thoroughly. But from the readings that I have done, I did not find that they actually do a very interesting job or a very good job of explaining the Quran through the Quran. Reason being, of course, they're lacking um, certain wider context that would make you better able to do it. But more fundamentally, because people of that ilk tend to hold the position that tafsir itself is um, not a valid thing to do because it is a very central doctrine for them that the Quran is clear in and of itself. That's why According to them, we don't, don't need the sunnah to be preserved and we don't need to go about collecting hadiths and authenticating them. So the Quran is clear in itself. So then why do you need some guy or some gal to be writing about it? Yeah, it's a slightly paradoxical situation that they are in, to put it mildly. Secondly, it is very, very commonly called the best approach. 
And in some very respectable sources, it is said that it is done first. That the first thing you do is explain the Quran through the Quran. The first thing when explaining an ayah is to look elsewhere in the Quran. If you do not find the answer, then you go to the Sunnah. And this may be familiar to you. We're going to see the quote of Imam Ibn Taymiyyah, rahmatullah alayhi, and discuss it a little bit. That is something that I return to a lot in my PhD thesis. But to be the best approach, is it so simple as to say that, you know, are there some things that would make it particularly well done and authoritative? Can it go wrong? Can there be EQQ, which is actually mistaken? I think it's not hard to understand that. Yes, you can do it wrong, in which case it's not best in that particular moment. So maybe in a broad sense, it is, it is the best or conceptually it's the best, but in practice, it's more complicated. Thirdly, it is often said that the reason why it's the best is because it is God explaining his own scripture, God explaining his own words. But is it God's own explanation? Remember I showed you these flight maps. It's very important for us to understand that the Mufassir is the one who's doing tafsir. It is not, you know, in general, we're not talking here about God explaining the Quran. There are some things that you could point to and say, oh, well, this uh, could validly be called um, divine tafsir, that this is God explaining uh, the Quran. Right, but that's very much a subset of what EQQ encompasses. Right, it is not everything that is EQQ is God explaining His own book. And then we also have the statement that it is the method of the Prophet. As I just said earlier, yes, the Prophet did do this. It's slightly more complicated when, when he's doing it, he's showing us the legitimacy of doing that. It's, it's mandating it as a method, yes. The Prophet ﷺ, though, is also a recipient of wahi, unlike anybody else. So to think that we are doing tafsir according to the method of the Prophet is just inherently a little bit problematic and difficult. But what I also uh, identified is that some people have suggested and claimed quite audaciously that all or most of the prophet's tafsir was of this nature and i i you know I, I studied this numerically and found it is just a very flimsy claim indeed as one can only find a few examples of this in the hadiths and if we narrow it down to authentic hadiths it becomes a um, very very small number indeed so let's take a look at some things um, said by scholars or even those who preceded uh, the scholars, uh, Sa'id ibn Jubair, explained Kitaban Mutashabihan in Surah Zumar as saying its parts resemble each other, attest to each other, and indicate each other. Right? And a similar thing has been narrated from Ali ibn Abi Talib. Zamakhshari is just an example of a mufassir, okay? And there are others who have said these things, but this is a quote from um, an early ish mufassir that the most correct meanings are those denoted by the Qur'an itself. Right? And you can find statements like this from Ar-Razi and others. But these are um, statements made in their tafsirs. You know, in the midst of doing tafsir, they have said such things. They were not writing um, a hermeneutical work, which is to say an usul al-tafsir work. Um, and I looked extensively at early works in usul al-tafsir, including, you know, the introductions to tafsir works and i struggled to find really any clear reference to the idea of doing tafsir of the quran through the quran yes it was being done as i've said on a practical level it was there on a theoretical level it is hard to find anything um, convincing until we can come to the famous treatise of ibn taymiyyah and this is called muqaddimah fi usul al-tafsir that's the title that is given to the work it's you know uh, in the 20th century, but it wasn't, it didn't have a title before. And this was a, a treatise which he wrote um, in response to somebody asking him to elaborate on the methods of tafsir. Um, and we're going to see Ibn Kathir a bit later. Ibn Kathir is a student of Ibn Taymiyyah. Ibn Kathir included this section and a, long, a much longer section from the Muqaddimah 
in the introduction to his tafsir, right? And some have even suggested that Ibn Kathir was the person who asked Ibn Taymiyyah to, to write him this treatise. Wallahu a'ala. So he says, if one should ask concerning the best approach to exegesis, then the answer is that the soundest method is for the Qur'an to be explained using the Qur'an. And يُفَسَّرَ الْقُرْآنُ بِالْقُرْآنُ And so there, the expression is used almost directly. What is left unclear in one place has been explained in another. And what has been made brief in one place has been expanded in another. If you do not find such, then make recourse to the Sunnah, for it explains and clarifies the Qur'an. So you see now um, why I'm, I'm, I'm saying that uh, people have been very influenced by Ibn Taymiyyah in the way they talk about this. And you can find this being said in many, many books which have the title Usul al-Tafsir or similar things. Um, to the extent that in, in works of the 20th century, you will find them saying that this is a matter of ijma, this is scholarly consensus, or they will even say ijma us salafi wal khalaf. Right? right. So, it is interesting to me to see how this statement got raised to that level. As a statement, it contains some tricky aspects and scholars have come and tried to explain those things. Like, does he seriously mean that one should look for the answer in the Quran first, as it looks like, you know, first? The word first is not here. Imam Suyuti adds the word first um, when he um, quotes this in Al-Itqan fi Ulum Al-Quran. Um, but it does look like he's saying you look there first and if you find the answer you would stop you would call off the search is there also an authentic hadith on the issue doesn't matter there would be no need to look at that because you found the answer in the Quran that is what it looks like he's saying but nobody really wants to accept that that is what he's saying and if you look at the rest of the way he talks about tafsir and the way he does tafsir as well in his uh, various writings on various passages of the Quran, then you would have to conclude that, of course, he does not uh, take it as plainly and literally as that. But that's what he's saying here. So a lot has to be teased apart in this uh, quote. Thereafter, we have got um, Dr. Zahabi, an Azhari scholar of the 20th century, um, similar quotes can come from earlier than him, uh, Az Zurqani, Manahil al Irfan, Fi Ulum al Quran. But what I liked about the Zahibi quotes is that you've got two competing quotes within the same book. In one place, he says that Tafsir al Quran bil Quran is universally accepted because such cannot be affected by weakness or doubt. But he also says, um, even earlier in his book, in fact, at Tafsir al Mufassirun, he says, it is not an automated process devoid of the need for thought. Rather, it is an action built upon a large measure of reflection and reasoning. I don't remember the exact words he uses here for reflection and reasoning, but he and uh, you know either he or others have certainly used the words ra'i and ijtihad. Ra'i wal ijtihad. And uh, the word ra'i is important here. Because one of the things that happens a lot is that tafsir al-Qur'an bil-Qur'an is classified as tafsir bil-ma'thur. Okay, I don't want to dwell too much on this, but it is very problematic to categorize it as ma'thur. Because yes, the Qur'an is ma'thur in the sense the Qur'an is transmitted. But the work of joining between the eyes is not ma'thur. That is based on the ra'i. So that's to put aside even my overall concerns and critiques of the whole idea of the dichotomy between tafsir bil ma'thur or tafsir bil ra'i. Okay, al-Shinqiti. Al-Shinqiti is a, a very important um, mufassir in this vein. In fact, he's written a book and we'll talk about it a bit later. He said, none better knows the meaning of the book of God than God. Right? So that's an example of what I have drawn your attention to already. But he also says, if a verse has an explanation from the Qur'an which is not fully satisfactory, then I supplement the explanation with the sunnah, i.e. to clarify the Qur'anic explanation. Okay. So, is this a contradiction? Well, I'm simply saying that this latter quote shows that when you actually get to the business of explaining the Qur'an through the Qur'an, 
it's not always going to be so clear. It is not God who is doing it. It's not God who is doing that tafsir. It's the Mufassir who is doing it. Tabat Tabai, I'm also going to talk about later, but he has, you know, and he is, uh, or he was uh, a Shi'i author, 12er Shi'a. Um, he has described EQQ as the oldest inherited approach. And I think he was trying to subvert this word ma'thur and turn it around and say, well, this was the way of the Prophet وسلم, and of the Imams of Ahl Bayt and all the important in, you know, interpreters. So that is to say, in the way that I've already critiqued, that it's as if that is the way that they did it and nothing else. So we're going to be looking at uh, the case study, which formed chapter two of my thesis. And I'm just giving you an introduction to that today. And inshallah, in due course, a lot of things, a lot of practical aspects and, and real life examples will, will come your way. And I hope be really, really interesting and inspirational as well. So why have I chosen Surat Al-An'am? Surat Al-An'am is, uh, well, I'm going to talk about that in the next slide, I just realized. Then I'm going to talk about um, the exegetes who are the, um, the subject of study, okay, or the object of study, the ones who form the basis of this case study, because I can't study all tafsirs. Um, I tried to do a smart study. So I selected those which were actually specialized in tafsir al-Qur'an al quran So I get the most rich results from them. So it's almost as if by covering them, I would have covered um, most of what there is in the whole tafsir tradition. Thirdly, um, how I've gone about creating a citations corpus. We'll see what I mean by that. Uh, what are parallels? What is evidence? I'm going to elaborate a little bit on that after having explained to you briefly before. And fifthly, um, to explain the nature of the new commentary that I'm presenting in this series and inshallah in the book, the forthcoming. Right, Surat al -Am. Um, This is just a very nice uh, snapshot of, of an ayah and a bit. Um, it is a lengthy surah, relatively speaking. It is about the length of one juz of the Quran, one thirtieth part. As such, it, um, that allows there to be uh, interplay within the surah. It also allows for us to encounter a variety of different kind of themes. So some legal verses even, although it's a Meccan surah. Um, we can find uh, obviously a lot of this about uh, aqidah, about creed, about tawheed, the oneness of God, combating shirk. Shirk is a, is a theme that, that runs very clearly through the surah. But there are, there are different types of theme and different almost sub-genres of Quranic content in Surah al -Nam. It is late Makkan, as I said, um, which places it then in the middle of Revelation. Right? It is, some said, 55th Surah to be revealed. That means we've got plenty of Surahs that came before, plenty of Surahs that came after. So it can be interesting to think what relationship is being drawn with those that are earlier, what relation with those that are later, even though that's not something that I gave a great amount of attention to myself. Um, there are two authentic hadiths that have the Prophet وسلم, making tafsir al Quran al Quran, and they both are explaining a verse in Surah Al An'am. And as it happens, both are explaining it with a verse in Surah Luqman. So we're going to see that not in this presentation, but in due course. And also, intriguingly, there are some cross references where an ayah says that we have already explained to you in the book such and such. And there are cross references that seem to go from an'am to other surahs and from other surahs to an'am. Why specifically an'am seems to be featuring here? I don't have the answer to that question at this point. So let's see the group. I'm going to be calling them the group. They are the mufassirs that I'm drawing from in terms of their citations and their general use of EQQ. The first in the group, and that's not to say the earliest tafsir that I'm using, but the first in the group is Ibn Kathir. The reason for Ibn Kathir is, uh, as I described to you earlier, his relationship with Ibn Taymiyyah, 
And therefore the kind of assumption, the working assumption that he is implementing the methodology of Ibn Taymiyyah. Or showing a way that it can be implemented, um, even if it can't be practiced or is not supposed to be implicated, uh, implemented quite as literally and straightforwardly as it appears. But that's um, from the group, the earliest one, because my basic task was to find any works that describe themselves as being EQQ primary. That is to say, that they have in their title or somehow in their mission statement that this work is about the Seer of Quran, Quran exclusively or primarily. And it's actually very interesting to find that there are hardly any works in the whole of tradition which fit this description. And most of them, as you can now see, are in the 20th century and beyond, but not earlier than that. So if we count Ibn Kathir, we're going back a few more centuries, but um, Mufassirin weren't writing specific works on Tafsir al-Quran al-Quran, as far as we have uncovered and are aware of, until modern times. That kind of puts a hole in Ibn Taymiyyah's idea that this is the best method of tafsir. Because if it was the best method, you'd think that Mufassirin would give it more space and more attention than they did. Instead, of course, they incorporated it within the tafsirs, amongst other methods. So then Amrit Sari Shilqiti, Farahi and Islahi are put together because they are uh, teacher and student, and Tabat Tabari, who we mentioned earlier. I've also included some earlier tafsirs I'm going to tell you about, Muqatil and Al-Tabari, and later tafsirs, and various other resources which I'll talk about. And that's my point, the, note, the overall paucity. I've explained that before. So the first in the group is uh, Ibn Kathir. This is the edition that I happen to be using. Um, Tafsir al-Qur'an al-Azim. Uh, this is his um, place of birth, date of death. Taymiyyin method, we've talked about this idea that he's implementing that. Oftentimes, uh, in his explanation under a particular ayah, he will start with some parallels. So I'm calling them parallels. He will just say something like, كَمَا قَالَ تَعَالَى As Almighty God has said, and then he'll mention some other ayahs which are similar in some way. The tafsir overall is rich in hadiths and various discussions. Um, and in the course of the tafsir, he will cite other ayat by way of evidence for various things. Secondly, Thana'ullah Amrit Sari. This is not a particularly famous tafsir. Um, uh, Amrit Sari is actually um, a very significant figure in Indian history. He was uh, a leader of the Ahli Hadith movement um, and was involved in, 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 in dramatic events in his life and debates with, uh, with other uh, groups, including the Ahli Quran movement. Um, he died in 1948, so just after partition in uh, Pakistan. This work is um, of an inline style, which is to say he would mention a few words and then mention a few words very briefly by way of explanation. And in his, in his introduction, he includes um, some notes from Shah Waliullah concerning Asbab al-Nuzul. And I've reproduced that in my thesis. Uh, I mean, I've summarized it in English in my thesis. Um, something interesting about this work is it was revised. This is a revised edition that you're seeing here, um, Saudi approved. Right, this is printed in Ar-Riyad. Um, his original version had uh, some influence from his, um, his Diobandi roots. So some kind of Maturidi creed and uh, things which met criticism at the time and he was sort of dragged before a committee made to repent. And so you can find some very lengthy footnotes of repentance in this uh, edition, which is quite interesting. Now, perhaps the most famous in the genre and people always ask me, you're doing Tafsir Quran al Quran? Is it about Shinqiti? Shinqiti, right? It's about Shinqiti. Tell me, yeah? Yeah? So, yes, he's in there. But I have to say, a Shinqiti's work did not prove to be hugely significant once I have examined it alongside others. His work is called Adwa al Bayan fi Idah al Qurani bil Quran. He's a Mauritanian scholar who then settled in Riyadh as well. 
died in 1972, of course, of Salafi orientation, uh, broadly speaking. His work is actually not um, a tafsir of every ayah of the Quran. I think a lot of people don't realize this. Of 165 verses of Al-An'am, he only discusses 49. Um, he often draws these um, ayah references from Ibn Kathir, uh, which is not to say it's all lifted from Ibn Kathir, just that you can see, I think it's quite reasonable to claim that he was drawing from Ibn Kathir uh, in, in, on top of his own observations. And if you're looking at this work from Surat al-Hashr onwards, you should know that it is not by Shinqiti, but by his student, uh, Atiyah Salim. Then we come to another 20th century phenomenon, which is the Nazm school or the Nizam school of Hamiduddin Farahi. So the followers of the school have tended to call it in English the coherent school. Uh, this is a, an approach to seeing the Quran as a cohesive unit and paying attention to the flow and the structural uh, features of the surah, even seeing the surah as a, as a unit with subunits within it, uh, as having an architecture which affects how it should be interpreted and understood. And the surah is within a structure of the whole Quran. So Surah Al-An'am, for example, according to this school, is part of a group of surahs, uh, which is uh, surah six, seven, eight, and nine together. Um, so that, that group, you know, almost like one of those continents, you could say, in the, in the world image that we, that we keep seeing. Um, this is a fairly um, new idea, but there are forerunners to, to aspects of this. And importantly, people talk about uh, Al-Biqa'i and his uh, Nazm al-Durar, uh, which, has, which bears some resemblance to what they have done. Uh, Biqai's work doesn't have many citations and cross-references though. My project was looking mainly at how cross-references are used or citations are being used. So yes, Farahi and Islahi do use them quite extensively. Um, Farahi's main tafsir work is called Nidham al-Quran wa tafsir al-Furqani bil Furqan. So Nidham al-Quran is at the structural side of things what Tafsir al-Furqan bil-Furqan is about this broader um, aspect that we are talking about in the lecture. However, his uh, Tafsir uh, does not include Surah Al-An'am. He did not complete a full Tafsir. He only did certain surahs. But we do have this work, which is called Ta'liqat fi Tafsir al-Quran al-Kareem. It is notes that he left really in his personal uh, mushaf. And then some of his students and followers have have taken those and, and published them pretty much as is with a few, um, you know, just enhancing notes. But um, that's very useful, just keeping in mind that they are just notes. So we don't exactly know what he intended to, to scribble down there. Um, and maybe he changed his views after making those notes, etc. I mean, Hassan Islahi is uh, the most prominent student of Farahi in, this, in the sense that he produced a full tafsir in Urdu, which follows uh, the methodology of Farahi. And this is called the Dabbir Quran. So that's something that we also make extensive reference to. Finally, and uh, this image is because I don't have a personal hard copy of it, I just use PDFs. Al Mizan fi Tafsir al Quran by the only Shi'i um, member of my group. Uh, the, the, you know which group I'm talking about here um, and I'm very glad that I included him in the study because it turned out that his work although it's not titled Tafsir al-Quran al um, he, he sets himself the goal of dealing primarily with intra-textual method which he calls istintaq al-Quran which is getting the Quran to speak right speak for itself, you know, you see I'm going to have a problem with that based on what I've been saying earlier. But the idea of making the connections. Um, his work is particularly rich, in fact, um, overall as a tafsir, you know, but um, in terms of what he included of EQQ material, that is also the case. You have within it a uh, riwayah sections and bayan sections. Riwaya, he's talking about um, hadiths broadly speaking, but also a lot of narrations from Ahl Bayt 
and then the bayan sections is what looks more familiar as uh, discursive tafsir. Um, and he also has a lot of asides where he deals with specific themes that come up. Additional sources. I went to earlier sources because I didn't want to say, you know, start the search with something like Ibn Kathir. I went to the earliest complete tafsir that we have, which is Muqatli ibn Suleiman, and also a Tabari's tafsir, because this also has a lot of such material in a Tabari's own words, you know, his own citations, and in the narrations from the Salaf that he includes in his work. Right. Um, so, for example, in An'am, he has five EQQ narrations from Abdurrahman ibn Zayd. So that's the largest number from one person. Um, later tafsirs, right? Tafsirs that are very extensive and interesting, like Tafsir al-Alusi, Ibn Ashur. These are things that I refer to and draw from uh, in order to get a completer picture and also, you know, to make sure I, I, I contextualize the tafsir. Uh, that's being done by that specific method by looking at a broader tafsirs and, and what kind of concerns are coming up there. I looked at some uh, Quranist translations, uh, which I've uh, mentioned before. Also, commentaries by Taha Jabir al Alwani and Javed Ahmed Ghamidi. Uh, these are two different things, but um, I'm just mentioning them in passing. Taha Alwani has this book, which is actually called Tafsir Surat Al-Naam, and it's within a series called Tafsir Al-Quran Al-Quran. So it should have been exactly what the doctor ordered, or what the Tafsir doctor ordered. And um, I could have, you know, just relaxed and not done this. In fact, I would even say the fact that that book existed was one of the things that pushed me towards thinking about Al-Naam. However, the book itself is very disappointing. And um, I won't say more about that just now, but it's very disappointing indeed. Javed Ghamidi's uh, book um, is helpful to try to understand more about the coherent school, because Javed Ghamidi is an adherent of that school and a student of Amin Ahsan Islahi. Uh, Rudi Parrett, their Quran commenter on concordance. Apologies to the Germans for my pronunciation. Um, this is an example of what we can just call an Orientalist work. Um, which, you know, particularly we're looking at the word concordance here. Um, that's an idea that has, you know, become more um, established um, now in the modern times. And he has done this work, which is both a commentary and a set of references to parallels, etc. But mainly parallels. He's not going to be citing evidences. So here's the thing. Um, if you look at this little Venn diagram here, everyone loves a Venn diagram. I'm just saying here that not all Tafsir al-Qur'an al quran consists of citations and references to other ayahs. And not all citations that come up in a Tafsir work are actually Tafsir al-Qur'an al quran right? Maybe the overlap should be larger here. But the point is, there's lots of EQQ which it does not consist of citations, such as what um, Farahi and Islahi uh, do best. And there are plenty of things which are cited, but I disregarded them because it was clear that it was a passing quotation that wasn't intended to explain anything or evidence anything, right? But concordance works can become all the more advanced in the modern times when we have each of us has got a personal computer of some description. We can, we can look up various websites to, to make an exhaustive list of parallels. Uh, my intention was to see what did the Mufassirin actually mention with their quote-unquote limited resources, but their stronger mental resources uh, than what most of us have. I also drew from the study of Quran, so the Anam commentaries by Maria de Kek, um, and also George's uh, translation, which didn't give me very much. So what I've ended up with is a citations corpus, right? So you don't have to make too much sense of this, but I want to explain this a little bit. What you can see here are the, the ayah numbers running down here, one, two, three, four, and then this is going down to verse 24. To get to all the way to 165, that is 17 pages like this. So that's one page, two pages, and then the 17 pages, all of that is actually at the end of my thesis. 
Uh, you can find the link for that at the end of this video. And um, you, can, you can have that nearby as you watch um, the series if you want, right? because this summarizes for you the references that I'm actually talking about. Um, we have here um, the verse and then parallels are listed in this column. And anything that could be considered evidence, I put in the evidence column, right? So I try to weight it more towards evidence. And the result of that is that you can kind of see that it's a kind of 50-50 split. Citations that are coming in the works of Tafsir are not, uh, you know, not the vast majority of them are parallels, as you might accept, uh, expect, but a good number of them are used evidentially. So it's roughly something like 50-50. I'm not, I'm not done a quantitative. Uh, study of that. Um, here, when it's a, a phrase, it's because it, is it paralleling a specific phrase or is it uh, evidence pertaining to a specific phrase? I don't want to explain all the annotation here, but one thing I will point out is that um, I gave special focus to things that were, were in the same surah, within the same surah. So if it's an am, I've, I've underlined it and I've placed it first. Okay, the other thing is that if you see it in bold, that is because more than one Mufassir cited it. So when you take a sort of bird's eye view of this, you would see that not that many bold numbers are appearing here. That tells you that the Mufassirin weren't referring to each other that much on this score. Um, they weren't copying their citations from each other, with some exceptions to that, like I said, sometimes Shemkiyotis take from Ibn Kathir or things like that. Ibn Kathir may be taken from At-Tabari, yeah? But for the most part, you're not seeing, and by the way, At-Tabari, Muqatil, and so on are included in this. Um, so that's a general idea about this citations corpus. This was made um, just to, to produce the, the, the verse by verse order to keep some sense of that. I'm restoring my original write, my write up, which was verse by verse, in order to produce that for the book. As a step towards that, I'm also, I've also made an Arabic um, restoration of this. So instead of having just the, the numbers, I've inserted the actual ayah in Arabic into a table. Um, I might show you that. Uh, I might show you that just now. Um, Just briefly. So I hope you can see that now. Uh, we're looking here at a, a document where, in the same way, this first column, just on the right now, is the parallels, and this column here is the evidences. So under each ayah, you can see it here with the translation, or our translation rather, um, I've now listed the parallel ayahs that have been noted by Mufassirin and evidential ayahs that have been cited by them as well. And so this is something like, and this is what, 93 pages? Um, so even without doing further analytical work, if you are epileptic, look away, um, you can see here that there's a lot that can be, it could make a very nice little book. So maybe I will, um, Oh, maybe I was not sharing that. Let me bring it back for you. Um, so this is this is the um, this is the document I was just talking about. You can see here the ayah, and you can see um, a column for the parallels and a column for the evidences. And when we are studying it verse by verse, I will be showing what is relevant about the ayahs and what point is being made and. Is that a strong point? Is it a questionable point? We'll have some thought process around that rather than just sufficing with this uh, list. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to the main presentation now. Right, so a few things uh, to finish off this introductory tour. Parallels, are parallels really a form of tafsir? at all. Right? If I have one ayah and I just say, well, this is a similar ayah, have I actually explained anything? Was there something unclear about the original ayah that needed 
that parallel? And when I provide the parallel, have I done any explaining? Has the other ayah explained the first one? Right? In a lot of cases, it is not tafsir. But why do they mention the parallels? Why is it relevant? Number one, the mufassir may be actually supporting something about his or her reading or interpretation, and they may not spell that out. So they could be using it evidentially, but subtly. So we don't know quite what they were, uh, they were getting at. But when we see that they considered something a parallel, we know that, well, they, they must have understood the ayah in a way that is somehow similar to that. Secondly, it could be that the parallel itself does clarify because its wording is more explicit or its wording is more spelled out and expansive. Or by looking at the context of that other ayah, we can understand something about the meaning of this ayah. What the Mufassir may be doing also is providing a cross-reference. And this is something that I think we can say about Ibn Kathir. Um, he wasn't, I think, doing much to see through those parallels, but he was perhaps uh, a forerunner to the cross-referencing uh, concordance approach of later centuries or you know, of the modern age, which is to say, have a look at these other ayahs. You might discover something for yourself. And fourthly, the Mufassir may be saying, ah, this is similar to that verse, and I have already explained this issue in more detail there. It may be before, or maybe they are just telling you it's similar to that. If you look at what I've said there, you might find further details, even if they were still to write the commentary on the other verse. When it comes to types of evidence, this is quite an expansive topic. You can also class this as types of bayan, types of clarification. I'm using the word evidence broadly to encompass types of bayan, and um, you know, which which is a, probably the closest term. The word bayan and evidence don't correspond, but right. Firstly, um, that evidence may be used to clarify something, the meaning of a word or a piece of grammar. It could be to elaborate. Um, I'm citing the other verse to elaborate on something which is, you know, left vague or very, you know, over brief in this particular ayah by itself would not be understood but with the other ayah it becomes understood it could be to modify the apparent sense so what i was going to understand from this ayah i realized that actually no this is not a universal statement there are exceptions to it so this could be what they call in usul al-fiqh takhsis or taqiyid or similar to that so there could be exceptions um, expressed in another verse this verse may be an abrogated verse, mansukh. So I need to know the nasikh, I need to know the other verse in order to know that that is the one that expresses the current operable ruling, not the one I'm currently reading, which is abrogated. So abrogation can be seen as falling within the rubric of tafsir al-Qur'an al-Qur'an. You may cite another ayah to build up the picture, right? So it's not that it necessarily um, explains this ayah, but it's something that has to be put alongside. Right? So this ayah by itself, let's say it's an ayah about free will. Well, if I just took it by itself and ignored everything else, I might get the wrong idea. I need to explain it by a thematic approach by providing other ayahs that are around this issue of free will, including those that indicate Allah's uh, knowledge and uh, predestination of all things, right? So that's a thematic picture or a comparative picture where things have to be kept in balance with each other. And similar to that, but a little bit different, is resolving apparent conflicts. It could be that this ayah I'm looking at is seen as contradicting something which occurs elsewhere in the Quran. Now, what's that got to do with tafsir? When I realized that I, you know, I have to rule out the idea that there's a conflict and a contradiction, that means I may have to re-evaluate what I understood in the first place about each one. So the two of them, in order to understand them as complementary, I have to have um, a less than superficial uh, interpretation of each one. 
So I may have to adjust. Once one of them says that they will um, say such and such on the Day of Judgment, the other one says they will not speak at all on the Day of Judgment. If I just took either one as the absolute word and ignored the other, I wouldn't have understood either one correctly. Once I see the apparent conflict between them and I say, ah, this is because, for example, they um, will speak at one point and then God will seal their mouths and they will no longer speak. Now I understand each one a bit better than I did before resolving this conflict. So finally, some um, features of the EQQ commentary that you're going to be watching in this series, inshallah, if your appetites have been whetted, um, and that you're going to find in the book, which may or may not look like this cover here. Um, this commentary draws from the Mufassirin, uh, but I don't only uh, mention the references they mentioned. I might say some things additional and some things from myself, if you permit. I'm influenced by them in dealing with it mostly synchronically. Now, this is a fancy word to say, um, looking at the ayat of the Quran as explaining each other, regardless of which was revealed first. Right? So taking the Quran as a completed corpus, as a mushaf, which we recite from cover to cover and back again, but we are not doing so in chronological order anymore. So it's taken as not mattering very much whether an ayah came before or after, it can still be used to explain. Its revelation it may not have come to explain something because uh, it might have happened almost the other way around. But when we uh, are reading a certain ayah, we might explain it with something that came earlier in revelation or later in revelation. So that's a synchronic yeah, at the same time, looking at flattening the, the time structure of the Quran. But sometimes a diachronic approach is needed. For example, when we do talk about nasq or abrogation, it is relevant to say which one was revealed later because that is the operable ruling. I'm going to implement some kind of evidence grading system. Um, so here um, I've opted for something like play and pause. Okay, so uh, play is like, I'm almost saying like, well played, <laughs> you know, this was a good evidence. This is a strong convincing one and when I say pause I'm saying well this deserves some pause for thought okay the play pause here is almost like mm, it's in between it's in between I would probably not uh, use the stop uh, the stop button um, in things that are going to come up in this course we'll see but of course there are some um, evidential maneuvers that are really really bad even if they are supposedly intra-Quranic. Um, so, so we should tell those people to stop. Yeah, just, just stop, right? So that's the idea of these symbols, which I'm going to try to implement uh, in amongst talking about the evidences. That's a subjective view. That's just my view. But I just want to encourage that we, um, that we try to form some critical thoughts about how evidences are used, rather than just saying, well, God knows best the meaning of his book. We want to say, well, you know, to what extent, what makes a good, solid EQQ argument and what is on flimsier ground, right? So in order to show that, I want to evaluate things that have actually been said. Not every aspect of tafsir is covered, right? So this will be a fairly detailed tafsir course, but not the same detail that is covered in a more detailed work of tafsir, like if we were reading Al-Alusi or Ibn Ashur, both of which I mentioned earlier. Uh, that is because it will focus on things where they actually have used uh, Quranic parallels or evidence. And you will see that we will remain within the scope of mainstream interpretations. And although this is like the very last point in the, in the whole presentation, it is quite an important one. You might think, you might suppose that if we go about doing tafsir of Quran al Quran, we're going to get very different results. But my finding, my finding after years of, of research, uh, which you can see in the thesis, is that for the most part, you find the same interpretations. You just find different ways of arguing for them. And 
that's not terribly surprising because the people who are doing it belong to mainstream schools of thought and um, they um, are, are not out to create new interpretations. You do find some new interpretations, for example, in the Farahi school. Um, but for the most part, you find the same opinions that you find in other tafsirs, but um, with some new subtle evidences for them from within the Quran itself. So finally, um, in terms of references that you can look at uh, during and after this course, there's the thesis itself. You can find that this link, eprince.source.act.uk slash 30286. And inshallah, the forthcoming book, uh, when it comes, will have uh, further details of this. وَآخِرُ دَعْوَانَا أَنِ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ